Welcome joining us on Enhancing Game Incubation one more time. And uh, for those who are joining for the first time, I, I just want to say that uh, Baltic Sea Games is the project, which is a follow-up project of Baltic Sea Games, we, where we are helping uh, uh, game industry experts to get better at what uh, they are doing. Either, either they are developing their games, consulting, investing on all kinds of fields. So we are bringing the best experts from all, all around the world, world to improve your knowledge, to share knowledge from the uh, best experts. And uh, we are keep providing these kind of uh, uh, webinars throughout the year. So, uh, and at, uh, uh, today we are having another topic where today we'll talk about the finances, about the event, uh, investors, how they are contributing to the uh, g game industry. And uh, I'm glad that uh, today we, we are having a true legend uh, here on a webinar. And uh, when I say a legend, I mean it because uh, uh, back in 2009, uh, this guy, Jason De La Roca, uh, was named by the Game Developers Magazine uh, among the top 50 uh, most, uh, the most important contributors to the game uh, industry sector. So it, it says a lot. And uh, currently, uh, Jason De La Roca is the co-founder of uh, Execution Lab. Uh, and uh, he is the one who really can talk about investing in games because he does investing by himself. So he has a lot of experience. He uh, invested in more, in more than 20 companies or, or even more companies. So uh, I'm glad that we are having you here, Jason. Hello. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's such a great... Uh... Great introduction. I almost forgot about that. Uh, the game developer <laughs> magazine. The magazine doesn't exist anymore. They, they stopped printing it. And, but uh, but, the, but the, the legacy remains. So yeah, 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 yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. You're going going back in time. So Jason, uh, just to start up, maybe you will talk uh, a bit about yourself. How you got into the game industry? What you are doing right now? What's your role? What you're up to? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, so so I've been in the game industry uh, so over twenty five years now. Uh, not all of that has been on the investment side. In the early days, I was more on the technology, graphics, chip, hardware side of things. Uh, and then I spent many years uh, as the director of the International Game Developers Association. So I was the uh, the sort of the head of the IGDA, which was a, a wonderful experience, which which actually uh, enabled me to see the world and meet developers. From, from every corner of the globe uh, and sort of deal with uh, you know every sort of layer from from students and, and hobbyists aspiring to be game developers to the Indies to the triple A's and publishers and investors and government and uh, all, all these kind of layers was was really really fascinating in academia as well uh, and then that led me to do uh, the first uh, venture backed incubator and seed fund which was execution labs. Uh, back in 2012, 2013, uh, give or take. Uh, and we invested in 25 studios from Canada, uh, United States, and uh, across Europe. Uh, and that was a massive learning experience because, uh, you know, when, when I started uh, Execution Labs or, or co-founded Execution Labs, I really had no experience on the investment side. I mean, I knew games, I knew game development, I, I knew, you know, talent and what, you know, what, uh, you need to do to make a game succeed, but the idea of you know backing founders and and nurturing companies and helping them grow and find success uh, was was uh, you know that was a new endeavor. So it was a great learning period, and we did that for a few years uh, and deployed the fund. Uh, and then more recently, I do uh, consulting work, uh, part of it around uh, helping studios and advising them on business strategy and fundraising, and then also I do a bunch of stuff around. Uh, economic policy and working with governments on how to help grow and invest their regional game sector. And so uh, under normal times, I'd be traveling the world to all kinds of, you know, fun places, exotic regions. We're all interested in growing their game industry. Uh, but now we do it on Zoom, of course. And uh, uh, hopefully one day I'll make it uh, there on the ground and not just uh, over Zoom. So next time. Yeah, so we also hope that uh, in uh, upcoming years, maybe we'll be able to 
bring you here in the Baltic Sea, uh, sea region and uh, invite you to some kind of conference to Great. network with our own uh, game developers and uh, game industry experts. And uh, as you said, as you mentioned, you had a lot of experience in various fields uh, related to the game development. But let's just focus today on the investment side uh, and yeah. how how to attract the investments, uh, how to be ready for it, and all those questions be, will be answered by your uh, mm. presentation. And I just want to remind uh, uh, to the audience that uh, you could also be involved in the uh, discussion afterwards, after the uh, Joe, Jason's presentation, there will be a Q&A session, and you are able to write down questions on the Q&A uh, uh, side uh, right here on the right side of your uh, screen we'll read those questions later on uh, after jason will be finished and uh, yes so the the stage is yours jason i will just turn on the presentation and uh, cool. then we will ready to listen to you awesome okay cool uh all right so hopefully these uh the slides work this is the first time i do this kind of remote uh, slide progression. Uh, all right. Well, again, thanks for having me. Um, I noticed here for some reason my email is cut off. It's supposed to be Jason at Delarock.ca, but I'm I'm easy to find uh, online. Uh, so as as was mentioned before, uh, I do a lot of work around uh, investment fundraising, uh, you know, and then also the policy side of things. And uh, Execution Labs experience was uh, you know great learning there were so many kind of layers to how finance worked uh, you know on the one hand we needed to go get funding ourselves so we had to chase uh, you know lps and 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 you know other investors to put money into execution labs so that then we were able to go invest in studios uh, and so it's kind of was this unique position where we had to do both things we had to chase funding ourselves and then we also had to be investors uh, and and scout for uh, great investable targets and invest in them and help them to to nurture and and grow. I mean, this was this was about ten years ago when investing directly in game studios uh, was quite rare. I mean, London Venture Partners was around doing a few deals, uh, but there really wasn't much uh, in the way of um, you know venture capital. Uh, certainly not like we see today with you know a dozen plus funds dedicated on the game sector with over a billion dollars uh, under management across just the dedicated funds uh, never mind all of the other more general funds that are now uh, becoming much much more interested in games and are investing directly and, and even on top of that all the strategic investors like tencent netease uh, etc like the publishers that come in uh, to, uh, to to invest um, and so uh, you know what we're going to cover today is really uh, some more subtle uh, insights in some way and, and kind of red flags and tips and stuff. Uh, I think, you know, most developers, if they want to understand finance, there's a decent amount of, of articles and blog posts and, you know, other folks that are talking about this kind of stuff. And I actually have a, a list of resources uh, at, towards the end of the presentation. Um, uh, you know, so if you want to find a, a template for a pitch deck and, uh, you know, other sort of more kind of high level advice, uh, you know, it's not so hard to find. Uh, and so I thought I would go a little a little bit deeper into some of the more subtle differences that people, uh, you know, it's just not obvious to most people as they as they get rolling. Uh, all right. So um, what we're covering today is, is kind of a, a better understanding of, of venture funding. So some of those more more subtle, subtle insights, uh, hopefully. Uh, will be some new new learning for you. Uh, you know, through that, to understand whether or not venture funding is right for you, uh, and 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 just not to waste a ton of time chasing VCs if it's not relevant in your case. And I see that all the time uh, when game developers, you know, they hear about those you know billions of dollars and they want some of that, but they're not really suitable for venture investment. Uh, and so being able to identify that is actually really valuable because then you can sort of not waste all kinds of time. Uh, and, then, and then at the end, hopefully this will increase your chance of scoring uh, some, some venture funding. Um, so we're going to dive in and hopefully by the end, you'll, uh, uh, you know, get some more money. And that's supposed to be a very funny uh, animated 
GIF, which I guess doesn't work in this uh, platform. So we'll move on. Um, all right, so I'm going to reference uh, a GDC lecture uh, that I did uh, two years ago, or in 2018. Uh, it's one of the free lectures on the GDC Vault. So if you go to gdcvault.com, you can punch in my name, uh, and the name of the lecture is Funding What When. Uh, and it's a it's one of those more I would say kind of um, intro level funding courses, uh, but or, or, or lectures. Uh, but it's a, I, I would say it's a fundamental one as you're trying to get started uh, to pursue funding. Uh, it's really important to kind of uh, whatever do your homework, and this is sort of one of the the fundamental lectures. Uh, and and really the two key lessons from that lecture was understanding that there is a massive difference between company funding and project funding. Uh, and many developers don't realize that. They're just like, oh, we're making a cool game. We have some cool ideas. Uh, you know, who's got money for us? Oh, Tencent has money. VCs have money. Uh, publishers have money. Xbox has money. You know, Apple Arcade has money. So they just kind of list all these sort of random disparate sources of funding uh, and don't realize that there's really kind of a fork or, or, or two, two fundamental buckets of dollars. And one is company dollars and the other one is project dollars. And so that GDC lecture really kind of breaks that down uh, and goes into depth about those differences. Uh, and the other key lesson was that the funding source changes relative to time. So if you're at the very beginning you know, sources of funding are different than if you're towards the end or in the middle of production or or if your company is starting or growing or profitable or unprofitable. Um, so not all sources of funding uh, kind of arrive at the same time. And so understanding that is also uh, super, super critical. So I, I encourage you to go back to that lecture uh, and and to sort of get that get that recap. Um, and th this now is kind of a, a, um, a bit of a high level summary of some of the points covered in that lecture, looking at the differences of project funding versus company funding. And here the, the, the fundamental sort of deciding factor is really whether you're doing game as a service or more like a normal product game. So uh, project funding goes towards products, G games. Usually that means premium. Usually that means single player. Usually that means things that you play once, right? So you, you load, you, you go to steam, you pay your 20 bucks, you download the game, you play it for 10 hours, you save the world, you know, beat the dragon and, and game is over and you, and you never touch it again. So it's like a consumable, uh, product. Um, so that's project funding. Uh, on the company side, it typically goes to games as a service. That usually means free to play. It doesn't have to mean free to play, but normally free to play. Uh, and these are, you know, game as a service. It's endless, replayable, session based, match based. Uh, uh, you know, it's uh, Fortnite, uh, Rocket League, uh, Hearthstone, uh, Clash of Clans, uh, um, you know, Candy Crush, uh, PUBG, et cetera, et cetera. So, so. Deciding which path you go down, project funding or company funding, is not really based on your preference or, you know, who you know or whatever. It really is determined by whether you are doing game as a product or game as a service. Uh, and, and that's kind of the deciding fork. So really, it's about the business model determines which source you should be going after. Uh, on the project funding side, you know, what are uh, investors, in most cases, publishers? Uh, or royalty investors like the Kowloon Knights, for example, you know what are, what are they really factoring uh, when they're looking at your your product pitch or game pitch? It's really around discoverability, right? So, so to what extent do they believe that this game will get noticed above all others? Meaning, you know, find an audience, have a community, make sales, etc. So, discoverability is a key factor. Um, you know, can the team deliver? You know, if they're going to put 500000 or a million dollars into that project, they want to know that you, your team can deliver, you know, more or less on time, on budget. Um, and also, you know, they're thinking about portfolio alignment, right? So if you're pitching your game to Paradox, you know, it better be a deep strategy game because Paradox only publishes deep strategy games. You know, if you're doing some uh, super indie, retro, neon, you know, gore shooter, whatever. Okay. Maybe you pitch that to Devolver because they like, you know, gore, you know, retro shooter type stuff. 
Um, so you have to be mindful of the of, of portfolio alignment. Those are some of the key factors. Whereas on the on the company side, it's totally different, right? It's 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 uh, the 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 VCs, the angels are backing the founders. I mean, we hear that often. That really, it's about the founding team, the co-founders, uh, and it's their grit, their mindset, perseverance, you know, pedigree, all, all that kind of stuff. The investors are looking at traction and and key performance indicators. What kind of metrics can you demonstrate? We we often hear that that you know you need traction, more traction, more proof, uh, and and it's absolutely true. Uh, and they want to see that this is going to scale, right? And you know, this is this is sort of the link to game as a service, free to play. Is that that gives you that kind of hockey stick uh, potential uh, to hit exponential scalability? If they don't believe what you're doing has exponential potential, you know, then then it's not it's not for for venture. Just don't don't bother. Um, deal structures. I mean, this should be fairly familiar to most folks on the project funding side. This is usually an advance against royalty, right? They're giving you money now because they're they're getting a share of revenue in the future, uh, and usually you're giving up various intellectual property rights. Uh, you know, the the rights to the sequel. Uh, you know, derivative rights. If a movie gets made, then the publisher's involved. This kind of stuff. Um, al although you keep the IP in most cases now, th there still is this kind of. Uh, um, you know, they grab certain uh, uh, rights on the IP. Uh, and then on the company side, well, obviously, uh, you know, they're buying equity, right? So they are becoming shareholders and partners in your company. So much more of a, call it a, a deep, a deep marriage. Uh, and you're giving up various shareholder rights so they can, uh, you, you know, veto you from giving yourself a, a million dollar raise or taking the money to, you know, go on vacation to Cuba, this kind of stuff. Uh, but but in, the mo in most cases, the investors are kind of trusting you and leaving you to run the business that are not usually getting involved in, in the day-to-day. -day. The, the goal on both sides is quite different. Mindset is quite different. Uh, you know, if a publisher is funding your project, they really care most about going to market, right? You know, they, they want to get that game on the shelf, onto Steam, onto, you know, Xbox, whatever, because that's when the revenue starts coming in. That's when their rev share kicks in. So they're focused on high game sales and maximizing sales potential. Uh, and they're really focused on, you know, doing better than break even. Uh, I mean, ideally, they double their money, triple, you know, 5x their money. Uh, but it's normally kind of more of a linear uh, success curve. On the company side, uh, you know, they're looking for long-term growth. They want the value of the equity they just bought to increase in value. Uh, they want you to go for a billion dollars, right? Can this become the next small giant that sells to uh, Zynga for, you know, whatever it was, $576 million? And they're focused on the exit, right? Because they're holding shares. They really only get their return once those shares liquidate, usually through M&A, so a purchase, or more rarely, but it happens, an, a public offering, an IPO, uh, you know, like Roblox when they, you know, went public. Uh, and, and and many others. In fact, you know, we see that quite often in the Nordics, uh, given the 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 Nasdaq North uh, Exchange or or the the Poland Exchange, of course, is a bunch of game studios uh, on there. So, super super quick, kind of looking at the difference between project funding and company funding. Again, I encourage you to go back and look at that uh, uh, the GDC Vault uh, lecture from 2018, which goes into much more detail uh, on this. Uh, but, you know, important to understand uh, nonetheless. Uh, on the company side, all right, well, this is now looks like a big mess because the, the animations are not working in this uh, uh, app. So uh, uh, unfortunately, you're getting all of the things all at once. But um, normally this graph works better when it's a step-by-step -step, uh, reveal. Uh, anyway, so what we're seeing here is uh, the timing factor for company funding options and sources. Um, the horizontal axis is time. The vertical axis is uh, profitability. So, you know, revenue generation, profit generation. Um, the, the small light blue line is showing kind of a typical curve of a company. So you start at zero and the blue, the, 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 the lighter blue line kind of goes downwards because you're burning cash paying your programmers and artists, you know, spending money, and you're not generating any revenue because you're building your game. So you're kind of only going negative. You know, then you hit sort of the bottom and then you go back up because now you spent money, you made your game, you've, you've launched into early access or soft launch on mobile, 
and oh, now we start generating revenue. Then you cross the horizontal axis. Uh, so now you're you're generating profits, and then you know the other you know from that point you're just kind of growing. And so what's shown here is that different sources of funding uh, arrive at different points on that thin blue line. So in the very beginning, at the start, it's the three Fs: uh, friends, family, and fools. Usually, this is you know tens of thousands, you know maybe a couple hundred thousand. Uh, they're coming in because they love you, they trust you, uh, or, or they're foolish enough to invest that early. Uh, and that's sort of the, or, or to yourself, of course. Um, and that's the initial capital you use to kind of get the prototype going, get the company started, start building the team. Um, and then when you have enough to show, then you normally go to angel investors or pre-seed VCs, or in some cases, incubators or accelerators, depending where you are, depending if there's relevant programs, but that could also be a source of uh, funding in, in that kind of zone. Usually that's less than a million dollars. And you use that money to continue working on the MVP. Uh, and then once you kind of start to you know, get the MVP in market and potentially generate some initial revenue to show that the game is monetizable, uh, you know, that's now when you go to the seed VCs and you're in that kind of you know, low, low millions range. Uh, and then you cross the break-even line, and now you're kind of uh, able to go to the normal VCs because your game is profitable, and they're writing multi-million-dollar checks. And then once, of course, you're at the growth stage, then you know you get ten tens of millions. Um, importantly, friends and family, angels, and seed. This is all before you're profitable. So they're they're really taking a bigger risk. Uh, you know, they're, they're really betting on the founders and the vision because you haven't yet been able to prove that you're profitable. Uh, once you cross the, you know, the break-even line, the profitability line, you know, now all the VCs and growth VCs, you know, they're all happy to, to fuel more success because you've already proven you have success. So one of, one of the, yeah, and then the, the red line kind of shows that the risk decreases over time. So, you know, your, your, your uncle that gives you $10,000 at the very beginning, even though the check size is extremely small, your uncle is taking the biggest risk because you've proven the least. You're at the very start of the journey. Whereas the growth VCs, even though their check sizes are potentially enormous, you know, 50 million, 100 million, it's actually the least risky because they've already waited for you to prove that you're profitable, that you have stuff that works, that you're, you know, a good, a good, uh, uh, a good company, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the kind of the risk and check size are kind of uh, uh, inversely uh, proportional. Um, one of the biggest mistakes that developers make is they'll go to see the wrong category of investor at the wrong time. And the most often one is that they're at the start and they go seek seed VCs or normal VCs, where they say, oh, we heard that uh, VCs love games now. Let's go call up some VCs and pitch them our great, you know, new studio. Uh, and you're 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 not at the right level on the little blue line. You're at the start. You go knock on the door of the VC and they'll say, "What? What are you? You don't come to me yet. Where, where's where are your KPIs? Where's your profitability? You know, where's the MVP?" And then you're like, "Oh, I'm just getting started. I need some money." And they're like, "Get out of here. Go go talk to friends and family. Go talk to angels." Uh, you know, it's like the same thing if you're doing a growth round of 50 million, you don't go backwards in time and call up your uncle and say, do you want to put in 10,000, right? The economics of the deal just don't make sense, uh, you know, for your uncle to invest at that, uh, at that stage. So you need to be really mindful of where you are in terms of the blue line profitability wise uh, uh, to determine which category or which source of venture funding um, is the right one to pursue and not really waste a whole bunch of time chasing a VC in the next category, you know, up that you're not ready for. Um, all right. So apologies for the jumbled graph. Uh, again, it, you know, it would have, I guess, made more sense if it was, you know, uh, uh, step by step. Uh, all right, moving on. So we're going to look into uh, a handful of key insights uh, that go into, uh, you know, how investors work and, and really what, what they're looking for. Um, and so we're going to do these uh, one, one by one. Uh, all right, so insight number one, uh, chasing unicorns. We all hear about unicorns, uh, you know, which is, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a startup that becomes worth uh, $1 billion. Uh, 
and 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 this is sort of you know super brief introduction to VC math. Uh, the reality is that uh, you know VCs have to take a portfolio approach. Success of any one investment uh, is pretty low. Uh, you know, despite all of their due diligence and scrutiny and scouting, you know, failure rate is still extremely high. Uh, so they have to build a portfolio, uh, and and most things in the portfolio will fail. So each thing that is a winner needs to make up for all of the losers. Um, and so that's why, uh, you know, just sort of making back your money or 2Xing, 3Xing, you know, doesn't work. Because if I have, you know, 10 things in the portfolio, nine things fail, the one that succeeds has to make 10 times, you know, plus, plus, plus uh, to make up for the difference. And so... Um, you know, this, I, I guess in North America, this is why we say that, you know, VC is like you're, you're trying to hit a home run every time as opposed to being happy with just, you know, a, uh, you know, moving on one base, if you use a baseball analogy. But um, so, so this is why VCs are trying to hit home runs is because the winners need to make up for all the losers. There's also this notion of uh, scale of funds. Right. So the way funds are structured is that normally the management, the operational admin side is paid for out of the fund itself. And, and normally it's two percent. Sometimes it's slightly less. Sometimes it's slightly more. But the average is two percent. So so, uh, you know, if I have a small fund, 20 million, I'm only extracting four hundred thousand dollars to you know, pay myself to pay my partners to pay my you know admin and you know what you know a website go travel whatever, um, and so there is this pressure to make the fund sizes larger, uh, in part to have more operational admin dollars, but also to be able to do you know larger checks, more checks, uh, follow on funding, uh, etc. Um, and so by 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 increasing the fund size, uh, it also puts pressure then that. Uh, you know, any one investment really needs to be a billion dollars to even be relevant uh, to, to the fund. And is often why, uh, you know, investors don't really waste time with, oh, I, I only need 50,000. I only need 100. It's like it's not even worth the legal fees and the effort to write up the paperwork for a $50,000 check. Um, so, I mean, this is from a, a VC fund point of view. Obviously, it's different if it's an angel investor that's just, you know, uh, personal uh, managing personal funds. Um, so, so you know, in part, this is why VCs are chasing unicorns, and that everything they do, there has to be some sense that the potential to be a billion dollars is there. And so, this is kind of the first hint that if what you're doing doesn't have that billion dollar potential, or you as a founder are just not interested in in pursuing uh, that level of scale. You know, that's your first hint that going after venture funding is not a good idea. All right. Insight number two. Where's my button? Uh, potential versus progress. This speaks to the difference between how angels and, and VCs work. So angels are individuals, right? They, they are amateur investors. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a person who has, you know, some amount of wealth either because they won the lottery or they sold their last company or they're from a rich family, whatever. Uh, uh, and they're, they're investing their own money. So they are amateur investors. They come in early because they're usually writing small checks, uh, but they are, ba they are investing based on potential. You have to pitch them uh, that future potential because you don't have anything. You're at the very beginning, you know, the, the hype, you know, the, 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 the potential for growth, you know, what, what it means to the market, you're really kind of, uh, um, you know, selling them that, that hype, that buzz, uh, you know, what the, you know, what the potential is, uh, and, and they're individuals. So they kind of get, they get carried away, they get emotional, they fall in love, uh, you know, they want to be part of that adventure, uh, and you know, they, they put money in. So you really got to hype the potential. Whereas VCs are professional investors. They do this for a living. They are paid to do this. Uh, they know what they're doing. Um, in theory, they act less emotional and can kind of get carried away less with that, uh, you know, buzz around the potential. Although, you know, at the end of the day, they're, they're humans and may still get sort of swept away. Um, but they do way more due diligence. They crunch numbers, uh, you know, and, and in part, it's because they're managing other people's money. 
right? They have a fiduciary responsibility to invest wisely and prudently and make smart choices and to demonstrate uh, that they, you know, did their homework and crunched the numbers. Uh, and so uh, VCs tend to invest based on progress. And by progress, it's also another word for traction or another word for KPIs. And so in part, this is why VCs always want to hear about traction. Tell me about your progress. Show me your numbers. What's the traction? How are your KPIs? Be because they need proof. They need validation. They need to show to their you know, bosses, their limited partners, that they did their job and they were uh, rational uh, in, in how they made their investment decisions. So understanding this little nuance allows you to kind of change how you approach different investors. If you're going after individuals, earlier stage angels, well, it's again, it's about potential, really hyping the potential, whereas if it's VCs, if you have no progress, no metrics, no KPIs to hand them, then, then you're wasting your time because they'll essentially tell you, oh, okay, sounds interesting, but come back when you have some numbers to show us, some traction, some, some validation. So again, this is sort of speaks a, a bit to timing again. All right, insight number three is what I call proof point funding. No one is funding you for you know, 10 more months of runway. No, nobody cares. Nobody cares about how many more months you wanna be alive. Uh, and, and they're not giving you money so you can let it sit in your bank account so you can feel comfortable, right? Investors are investing based on use of funds. You know, so often when you're getting pitch deck advice, they always say on the ask slide at the end, make sure you have a little mention of how the funds will be used. Uh, but importantly, it, it's, it's, it's about milestones, right? So it's, it's less about, I'm going to use the money to pay for UA and, hire another artist and, you know, uh, I don't know, do some marketing or whatever. It's more about what do the funds allow you to achieve? What milestone do you hit? So, for example, uh, you know, if you're very early, it could be, you know, the angel money is there to help you finish your MVP and put it into soft launch. You know, that's a very important milestone, right? Getting your MVP into soft launch or to, you know, early access or whatever, depending what kind of platform you're on. Um, and so uh, what that allows you to do is once you're in early access or soft launch, you start collecting KPIs. So the, so the angel investor is, okay, great. I, you know, I believe in you. Potential sounds exciting. I like the team. All right, you know, let's use my money to get us into, into, the, or into, the, into the soft launch. Uh, so it's, it's sort of proof points, validation stages like that. Whereas if you just tell them I'm using the funds to hire a programmer and do some UA, it, it, it's not it's not meaningful to them. It's like okay, whatever you, you need a, another artist. Okay, like but like w what does that achieve? What does that get us? So you have to think about it in terms of what the so the real milestones are, and the the way you think about it is how does that validate the vision or or the thesis of our business, right? So if you think that your game is going to be the next you know I don't know whatever Clash of Clans, okay, that sounds exciting but you haven't proved it yet. So the next sort of point that helps validate that thesis is getting our MVP into soft launch. So it's one step closer to proving that we're right. And so you, that's kind of how you have to think of use of funds or, or this idea of the proof point funding. Uh, because if it's just, I don't know, give me money for 10 more months or one more year of runway and we'll see where we get, like, like n nobody cares about, you know, 12 more months of runway, they want to know, okay, what, what, you know, what proof does that buy us? So, so you really have to think about uh, your ask in regards to proof points. All right. Which leads us to the, the next insight, which is uh, investing for the next investor. Current investors are always thinking about who the next investor will be at the future round, right? If an angel is giving you money today, they have to believe that their funds will get you to that proof point. So for example, MVP into soft launch, because an MVP in soft launch will generate the KPIs that you need to get the next investor on board, which is let's say a seed VC or a VC. So the, invest, the angel today is making that calculation in their brain because if they don't believe that's the case, then they're wasting their money. 
right? If they're just giving you money to kind of live for 10 more months, but there's no sense that that 10 more months gets you to the next proof point, then they're going to, they're not going to believe that the company will be able to attract the next round of funding. So, yeah, so exactly here what I said here, will the current funds deliver enough proof for the next round? So, so you always have to be thinking that you're, you're raising the current round of funding to enable you to raise the next round of funding because you're, you're, you're aligning it with sort of proof point to proof point. And each investor is thinking that way as well. Whether or not they actually say it or articulate it, inherently, innately, they're thinking about that. And that's kind of their, their, their invest or don't invest. Uh, uh, instinct is they're thinking about, okay, where does this get us? Is the next investor going to invest? Is there going to be enough proof point a year from or, or 18 months from now? So they're trying to imagine what that future situation is like. So you have to be thinking, you know, next round. All right. Insight number five, uh, engagement, uh, engagement, uh, sorry, versus, versus revenue. Um, in most cases, the focus needs to be on engagement. You, you will often hear this, especially from the you know the game savvy investors. I don't, I don't care about revenue for now. Focus on engagement. Uh, focus on your funnel. You know, focus on retention, play time, session time, return rates, all this kind of stuff. Uh, uh, because the assumption is always that if I can have a high retaining or a high engaging game, that the monetization can be turned on after. Uh, but you know, if the engagement's not there then monetization is not going to happen uh, anyways. And I mean, just sort of philosophically, the funding in many ways replaces the revenue, right? The, the, the assumption is, you know, what we have, or we're focusing on other things that are not about bringing in revenue dollars. You sell the potential that in the future, what you're doing can generate revenue. And so the investor is giving you money now so you can fund your activities because you have no revenue to do that, uh, you know, because n sort of normal businesses, they have a product, they sell the product that generates revenue to like keep selling the product and, and sort of we're intentionally not generating revenue. So, so, you know, th there does have to be a focus on the fundamentals of engagement, um, uh, you know, and the typical sort of, you know, KPIs and metrics that we all, you know, learn, um, in the beginning, because the funding essentially is the replacement of the revenue that gives you the runway to pursue, you know, those those goals. So, so I mean, I, I literally had this call yesterday with a developer who's like, I, I'm so worried about my monetization. I said, listen, don't even turn it on, you know, soft launch, focus on on retention mechanics that, you know, you're going to learn so much about player behavior, you know, no, no stress on, on, on monetization. Um, so keep that, keep that one in mind as well. All right. And then the last little insight, uh, is avoiding game as a product illusions. And so uh, what, what, what do I mean by that? So what I've seen is that uh, a studio, an indie studio, will mainly be doing games as products, you know, $20 Steam game, uh, you know, 10 hours, save the world, you know, play it once kind of game. And they're able to attract a friends and family round of funding into the company. So even though before I said that if you're doing games as products, you really should only be pursuing project funding, uh, what, what happens sometimes is that the, the, the team will enable, uh, will, will, will go attract some friends and family, the uncle, the best friend, the, you know, their, their, their other studio buddy that you know, had an exit and has a bit of money, whatever, and boom, they invest in the company. And so they've gotten an equity or a venture investment, but they're pursuing products. So then they think, oh, well, now we've used up the friends and family money. Let's go get the next round of company funding. Uh, and it, it doesn't happen because the, the friends and family round only was able to happen because they're friends and family, because they love you. They want to see you succeed. It's a personal uh, sort of investment. But because you're doing game as a product, it means you really should not be on the, on the venture side of the track or, or, or fork. Um, so I've seen that a lot. And then, and then studios, despite the fact that they got a first round or a seed round from friends and family, they're super frustrated that now all the VCs don't want to give them their next round of funding, even though the demo is cool and, 
and and whatever it's because of this reason is because your game is a product you should only be on the on the um on the uh, project funding side no problem taking that first initial funding from friends and family and do it as a venture investment now you have you know your your best friend and your uncle on board that's fine but just understand that that does not open the door to further company funding from from VCs uh, unnecessarily, um, and then and then also um, you know obviously we see now this kind of frenzy with Embracer and, and all these company kind of buying up uh, all the studios. Um, that really is separate from venture investing. Uh, I mean, certainly the venture investors uh, are excited that they're getting more exit opportunities, uh, but but. If you are mainly working on games as products, you know potentially you're a target for Embracer to buy you, but that still doesn't mean that um, uh, that VCs will invest in your projects uh, or your company that's doing projects. So I, I mention these because I see these sort of traps and people kind of get confused, you know, wh why they're not able to go after venture funding despite you know these two bullets, uh, and so that's that's why. Uh, all right, so let's. Uh, so th th those are the sort of six insights that are not sort of always obvious or, or discussed. And now we're going to talk about uh, uh, some key roadblocks or red flags. Um, all right, so the first one: uh, the founders need to be first, or, or, or rather, it's a red flag if the founders are not first. Uh, you know, th th this kind of statement. You know, when we get the funding, you know, we'll get started. I mean, this is the worst thing uh, uh, any any founder, co-founder can say to to an investor, right? The founders are expected to take the initial risk. Uh, you know, you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in the team. You have to believe in your vision to you know put yourself at risk. Uh, and so, in that sense, the founders are always the first investor, w whether or not that's actual cash you're putting into your own company, normally it's not, normally it's the sweat equity, uh, but just keep in mind that the founding team is always the first investor in the company. Um, and if that's not the case, then it's rare that an uh, external investor will be the first one uh, uh, to take that very initial, initial risk. Uh, I mean, we see this more often with uh, AAA developers. You know, they've got a, a high paying job at Riot or, or Ubisoft or EA, and they don't want to leave their, you know, cushy job until an investor gives them $20 million or, you know, something crazy. And they're like, OK, yeah, sure. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to stop working on Assassin's Creed. I'll come do my own thing. Just give me the 20 million and I'll quit my job at Ubisoft right away. Um, I mean, it's extremely rare that that will ever happen. You know, you have to quit. You have to sort of commit. Um, and uh, and take that initial risk and be be the first investor, uh, whether it's cash or not. All right, roadblock number two is the founding team itself. Uh, uh, investors rarely back solo founders, uh, and also less likely to back first time founders. It happens. There's always exceptions, uh, but the rule of thumb is they don't like first time. They don't like solo. Uh, so putting your uh, team together is extremely important. Uh, and, and listen, at the end of the day, there's so much work to do. Uh, you know, you need connection skills. There's just so much that, that you don't want to be alone uh, anyways. Uh, and, and importantly, you know, regular staff, you know, you often see, well, can I just be the boss, the founder, and then I just hire all my staff? Uh, well, but the staff are not investors. Like they're not, they're not putting in their sweat equity. Staff are expected to get paid because they don't own the company. There's nothing that they, uh, um, uh, they have no sweat equity, they have no skin in the game. So, so they sort of don't count as early investors. So, um, so really you need to you know, put the team together. Uh, and uh, I always recommend that the founding team should be a minimum of three people. Someone more on the business management side type leader, someone who's more of a creative leader, and then someone who's more of a technical leader. Um, there could be others, but I think as a minimum, you want these three things represented because uh, to me, that's sort of like the, the triad of when you're going to have hard discussions, debates about vision, decisions around products. Uh, it's always this kind of 
push and pull between the technical aspects, the business aspects, and the creative aspects. And you want uh, you want those debates or fights to happen on equal footing, right? So let's say the founders were business and creative, and you didn't have a technical co-founder. And when you had to have a debate about product roadmap, and you kind of called your employee up, say, okay, hey, employee programmer, come talk, talk to us about the... And they're trying to tell you, oh, but boss, this is not going to work. This is, can't happen. This is going to be too risky. You know, the tendency would be, oh, you're just an employee. Like, do what you're told. And, you know, we're, and, and they can't really fight because they're afraid they're going to get fired or they're going to lose their job or whatever. So you want, you want everyone to be sort of on equal footing so they're not afraid to be, uh, uh, you know, fired or whatever. I mean, you know, this is kind of when you're having these uh, – existential debates on vision and roadmap and so on you want kind of equal equal footing and then also you know at the very beginning when you don't have a team you know if you have these three people at least you're able to to build stuff market stuff you know create stuff uh at the base level um and then just a final note here on the rock star raise uh we do see that when uh you know it's a team from i don't know the 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 executive producer of league of legends leaves riot and then you know before they leave the parking lot they've got a check for 25 million dollars uh you know with no team no no prototype no nothing um so there are these sort of what i call the rock star exemptions uh where you have people that were leading you know multi-billion dollar products uh and as they walk out the door they basically have money in their pocket to do the next thing listen you know when when you get to be the producer on fortnite or, or, or League of Legends or, or whatever, you know, then, then you can go do a rock star raise without worrying about any of these other things. But for, for us mere mortals, uh, you know, we have to sort of heed uh, all, all of the other uh, kind of normal, normal issues. Uh, but I did want to mention that because that does, uh, does happen. I mean, it's like, um, was it just a couple of weeks ago, there was uh, the studio in California that was like X uh x um uh, call of duty and and uh uncharted and god of war and they announced the start of the studio with a hundred million dollars of funding it's like unbelievable so that that's that's what i would call a rock star raise right the, the investors are expecting that this team is going to go make the next uncharted the next god of war that's going to sell for you know a billion dollars and, and whatever so uh yeah when, when, when we ship our Uncharted, then we can sort of do that. All right, next roadblock, uh, business model scalability. So this sort of links back to the discussion around VC math and unicorns. Uh, you know, really, you have to question yourself, are you in the billion dollar race? Uh, you know, are, are, are you scalable? Are you doing game as a service, free to play? Do you have a meta, uh, you know, a strategy that allows uh, it to scale exponentially? Um, and and your 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 ambition your ambition needs to match VC math, uh, and you have to be exitable you know at some point in the future. Uh, and you know just a note here that VCs have extensive software as a service experience, so they understand game as a service. They understand those patterns and those metrics uh, and and what that looks like and whether or not you'll truly be uh, scalable. So you know if you're not in that race, fine. You, you don't have to be in that race. But if you want to go after VCs, you need to be in that billion dollar race. You have to have that level of ambition uh, and, and that level of potential. Doesn't mean you're going to hit a billion dollars, but at least at the start, you have to be on that track, you know, with that, with that mindset. Uh, and, and, and investors can sniff it, right? If, if they don't see that level of ambition, then they, you know, they kind of move on to the next, uh, next investment. All right. Uh, next roadblock, uh, lacking focus. This I often see with uh, studios that have ongoing business, like you know, maybe maybe you were doing work for hire contracts, or you have other side pursuits that you're doing, and now you're doing something that's maybe venture investable, and so you're trying to juggle your your contract work with this new IP and whatever. Uh, investors don't buy into that, right? They want to see that you are singularly focused. Uh, only on the thing that's going to get you to be a billion dollar company. And, you know, some side contracts doing work for hire doesn't help with that, uh, just as an example. Um, and so they, they, you know, oftentimes the funding is also to replace 
those income sources. So I was like, okay, drop drop those contracts, like ship that, get rid of that. You don't need that source. Here's the funding that allows you to pursue the billion dollar uh, idea. They also don't like awkward corporate structures where you have subsidiaries or you know, game as a product under one roof and game as a service on the other, you, you know, or or you know, just weird cap tables. All this kind of messiness uh, also kind of distracts investors and kind of ru ru ruins the potential for for deals. All right. Roadblock number five is what I call the, the, the no bargains uh, roadblock. Investors are not looking for a bargain. And what I, what I mean by that is often when a founder or, or, or team says, oh, but we only need 100 or we only need, you know, or, or from this region where it's very cheap labor, so we only need this amount, right? The, 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 the investor doesn't care about, they're not looking for, you know, a little discount or, or a bargain on the investment, they're looking for something that can become a billion dollars. And, and they're happy to deploy capital to back a winner or, or to back a team that has the potential and ambition to be a billion dollars. If that's a hundred thousand, it's a hundred thousand. If it's a million, it's a million. Like, like they're, not, they're not looking for a, a savings or, or a bargain. Uh, and this is true for publishers as well. Even on the project side, in most cases, People are thinking about what is the upside potential? Where can this go? They're not trying to, you know, nickel and dime. So instead of giving you 200, I only have to give you 150 because you're from an inexpensive region or, you know, I get to save on the deal. They're not looking for, for uh, bargains, um, right? They're, they're really looking to, to back, uh, back the winners. All right, the final um, roadblock, I kind of hinted at this already, uh, is, is just the, the cap table. Uh, and I've seen deals ruined by the capitalization table. So, so basically, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming most of you know what a cap table is, but this is essentially like a spreadsheet that tracks who owns what shares, right? So I'm a co-founder. I own 30%. My other co-founder, 30%. My uncle that invested at the beginning has 5%. Uh, you know, Tencent that gave us a million dollars at the start owns 10% also. You know, like what, like who owns what? Um, often what happens is you have dead weight on the cap table. Right, like, like you took fifty thousand from your uncle and gave him half the company, you know, because you just didn't know any better. And your uncle said, "Sure, fifty for half. That sounds good. 50-50. Uh, and and then and then an investor looks at this as your uncle owns half the company. Like, is your uncle the programmer? And you're like, no, he's sitting on the beach. And so so it's like, like investors don't want to see dead weight in the cap table. They're not really contributing value or where you kind of made unwise decisions because you just didn't know any better. You were, you were sort of too rookie. Uh, and es essentially the investors want to ensure that the founding team, the ones doing the day-to-day -day grind are sufficiently motivated to keep pursuing the vision, to keep chasing the billion dollars. And of course, each round of funding further dilutes, you know, your, the founder stake. So if, if you're starting off where your uncle who's sitting on the beach owns half the company I mean that's a huge chunk of the of the of the equity that's kind of not servicing the business, uh, and so a lot of investors will just walk away from that, or or they'll like try to buy out the uncle and say, hey, listen, be reasonable, you know, let's reduce your fifty to five, uh, or, you know, whatever. Um, and and an important point here is that you need to avoid early investors who are greedy. Unwise or rookie early stage investors will try to force you uh, or, or uh, you know, coerce you into giving them more equity than they should have. And what that does is it poisons the cap table. So, so experienced early stage investors understand this. And as we said before, uh, uh, investors are thinking who's going to invest in the next round. And so a wise early stage investor knows that if they take too much equity now, it's going to scare the next investor. So they will take, you know, the appropriate uh, amount. What is the appropriate amount? Obviously, it's always dependent on the on the deal size and, uh, you know, how far you are and how much they're, how big the check is. So it's really kind of hard to say. Uh, but but um, but yeah, you have to be careful of early stage investors who are, are too uh, are too greedy. Uh, all right. So th those are the those are the, uh, the, the, the six key insights. And the six key uh, roadblocks, of course, you know, there's much, much, much more stuff to cover. We're, we're barely scratching the surface here. 
Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I thought these sort of things are not often talked about, a little more nuanced, so I wanted to cover them uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, there's a great uh, blog post from a, a neighbor of yours, uh, Joachim, uh, that runs the Elite Game Developers uh, website and blog and podcast and all that good stuff. Uh, and he, he wrote up a great article called uh, 20 Reasons uh, Why Investors Say No. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch of other, you know, cool stuff in here and insights, red flags, et cetera. I, I strongly encourage that, uh, that blog post if you haven't already uh, seen it. Uh, and then in terms of other resources, uh, well, Elite Game Developers, that website is a great one. Uh, investgame.net is a wonderful site that tracks all of the venture deals, investments, and M&A and IPO activity. So if you want to, uh, you know, keep tabs on what deals are happening and who's investing in what, uh, that's a great uh, uh, website. Uh, Agnesio Capital is one of the premier investment bank firms uh, in the world that they do a whole bunch of the M&A deals. Uh, and they have a weekly newsletter that also recaps uh, business news and deal news and M&A news, et cetera. Uh, Gamesbeat is another great website. Uh, I mean, you know, Gamesbeat, uh, 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 game developer, uh, games industry biz, you know, all of these uh, uh, cover in most cases the deals and stuff. But, uh, I, you know, Dean from Gamesbeat is uh, especially, uh, you know, diligent to cover the deals and so on. Uh, and there's a really nice website called games1.co uh, that has a VC ranking. Uh, so you can go look at the uh, dedicated game funds and how many deals they've done, what their uh, capital and their management is, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then I've got two books here on the side. Uh, venture Deals is really the reference book. Uh, if you want to pursue venture funding, you have to read that book. It never mentions the word game once. This is a very, very a traditional uh, you know, tech uh, type of, uh, uh, of book, but it's uh, you know, really, really good. And then if you're just getting started out and sort of thinking of starting a company, you're kind of first time entrepreneur, I would encourage uh, The Art of the Start by Guy Kawasaki. Again, never mentions the word game once, but it's a nice kind of intro to entrepreneurship uh, book um, that I recommend uh, all, all of the time. All right, final words of wisdom. Nobody cares about your missing money problem. Nobody cares that you need money. Uh, uh, you know, they just, they just don't care. It's, it's not their problem to solve. You know, they, they want to back uh, opportunities. Uh, you should only be chasing venture funding if your ambition and business model matches, meaning, meaning you're going after a billion dollars, you're doing games as a service, highly scalable, uh, et cetera. Um, when you're out pitching, you pitch potential early, right? So you're hyping uh, the, the early stage investors because you have no traction, you have no KPIs. And then once you have made progress and you have KPIs, then you're pitching that progress to later stage investors. Uh, and do your homework, you know, ha have empathy, understand how VCs work, understand why they invest, understand what they like to invest in in past deals. Uh, you know, don't, don't just sort of run at the wall uh, or spray and pray as some say. Uh, do your homework, be more, more laser focused, more, more targeted. Uh, and hopefully with that, you'll be, you know, swimming in the money. This of course was animated as well with them rolling around the, in the pile of cash. Uh, and good luck. Thank you very much. And I guess now we'll move into uh, some, some Q and A. Awesome. So I guess, yes, you can stop uh, sharing. No, oh, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, huge. Applauses to you. <laughs> it was a really extensive presentation, and at least uh, me myself, I, I was really enjoying it. And uh, I heard uh, a lot of good insights that probably young studios are missing. And uh, our uh, incubator network is actually working with lots of uh, young companies. So I think those, all those insights, will be very, very helpful, helpful for for them. Cool. And. Yeah, so thank you very much uh, for these um, uh, insights. And uh, uh, there was a question from Alan, actually, it was a technical one, if we are recording this webinar. So yes, it was recorded. Uh, so, uh, and uh, if Jason uh, will allow us, uh, we'll publish this on our own uh, YouTube channel. So where we are posting our all webinars that we are having in this project. Sure. And uh, it was great, Jason, that you also shared some sources uh, that you are using for yourself, like uh, jo Joachim Achren. Oh, yeah, he was great. 
Yeah. Yeah. He was our uh, guest uh, on the previous uh, uh, webinar. Oh, so yeah. it means that we having re really good content out here. Uh, a yeah. big stars, only the big stars, <laughs> and legends. Yeah, jo jo Joachim is great, and and uh, you know he has experience, and his desire to share, I think, is really commendable. I, I spoke with him a few years ago when he was just starting Elite Game Developers. Uh, he had all kinds of ideas of like, how do I help entrepreneurs? How do I help and support startups? Uh, and we had a really nice discussion. Actually, I remember it, it was at um, uh, at Gamescom in Cologne, in the the lobby of the the Doron, like one of the main hotels across the street. And we sort of sat there. It was nice and air conditioned without all the you know tens of thousands of people. We had a nice conversation on like how to how to support entrepreneurs. So yeah, great, great that you know you've had him on before. Yeah, and continuing with the QA session. So we have like a question and, and a comment uh, from Alan, uh, okay. who is uh, saying that uh, while you are developing the game or uh, pitching the uh, game for the uh, VCs, you have to have this kind of mil uh, milestones, uh, the goals that should be uh, a, a deli deliverables that should be reached uh, in some part of the project and uh, how to really cl cl claim that you uh, will uh, implement those kind of goals and what kind of goals can you could you pre provide some kind of examples what mm. kind of kpis the company should have as a proof that they re will really de deliver uh, those kpis yeah. yeah well i mean the the example i started to give was this kind of uh, you know mvp to soft launch right so um you know i'm just going to make it up at the very beginning it's uh it's you and me we're starting a new you know game company and we have a vision to I don't know, we're going to make mobile games that, uh, I don't know, sports, and I, we'll come up with something, nin ninjas and sports. And uh, so at the very beginning, it's just you and me with some ideas. We don't have anything. We, we have no money. We, we have no team. We have no MVP, no prototype, no nothing. So at the very beginning, we go to see friends and family or, or love money. So you go see your uncle. I go ask my dad. I, I go to my old doctor friend down the street that uh, has some money. Uh, you know, we call our friends. Because they'll invest because they love us. They'll invest because, oh, yeah, I hear games is something big. Sure, you know, I'll put in 10,000. I'll put in 20. Now, listen, not all of us have friends that are family members that can put in, you know, 20, 50, whatever. But, I mean, this is kind of how, how it works. Um, so they're investing not because you show them your day seven retention number. They're investing because they love you. So that's the initial capital. And, and then also whatever we put in, whatever our savings are, whatever sacrifices we're making by not having a full-time job, et cetera. So that's the friends and family round. With that, we hire a programmer. We, we start working on our prototype. We put together a strategy um, and, and, and a vision. And then maybe the next one is we go see uh, uh, angels or, or in some cases an, an incubator. So we say, okay, here, here's our team. Here's the vision. Uh, here's our, you know, why we think ninja sports games are going to take over the world. Uh, we have a super rough prototype to show you that, you know, karate chopping a soccer ball or, or, or basketball is actually fun. Uh, um, and then the angel says, wow, that's amazing. I, I can see this being a billion dollars. Okay. Here's, here's a hundred thousand um, dollars. And then and what you promise them is, okay, with your investment, we're going to take our prototype, build it to MVP and soft launch it in, you know, Australia or whatever, uh, to generate KPIs. So the investor says, well, that sounds good. If you go get positive KPIs, that allows us to then pursue VC money. So, so now whether they believe you or not, I mean, you know, that, that, that has to be the plan. So you say, okay, to go from our prototype to build an MVP and sort of run a couple of months in, in soft launch to generate numbers, you know, that's going to take, I don't know, eight months. You know, our burn rate for eight months is uh, X. So we round that up a little bit. And so the money we need is, you know, whatever, X, Y. So the investor says, okay, that's fine. Here's the X, Y money, 100,000, whatever, 150, whatever the number is. Uh, and then we proceed to deliver. We have to go from our prototype, build the MVP, put it in soft launch in Australia, generate some KPIs. Now, listen, if we screwed up, and, and nobody wants ninja sports games, well, then, you know, we're finished or we have to pivot or it's the, sort of the party's over. But if the KPIs are looking positive and things are sort of trending up, 
Well, now we go see a VC or a seed VC and we say, hey, listen, we got a friends and family around. We built a prototype. Then we uh, then we uh, attracted an angel and that allowed us to build an MVP and generate some KPIs. Now our, our day one, day seven, day 30 retention numbers are looking you know, pretty good. We still believe that sports ninja games are going to be a billion dollar business. Now we need, you know, a million dollars to, uh, to to further validate that, to get better KPIs, to work on our D60 retention, to, you know, turn on monetization, whatever. And so the investor says, okay, sure, you know, go. For it. And, and actually, um, I will reference uh, again that GDC lecture because I did the, uh, the journey of uh, Small Giant, the ones who created uh, Empires and Puzzles. Uh, because that's kind of how their funding journey went, right? Friends and family, angels, CVC, VC, growth, M and A, uh, and and I, I kind of cover that uh, uh, that story uh, in, in detail in the timeline. So again, I, I encourage you to go back to um, to that GDC lecture, and you'll get a much more detailed answer. Okay, so uh, when, for example, the uh, company is going to pitch for the first time for the angel investor or the Seed, uh, seed VC fund uh, funder, uh, do do that company has to uh, pitch these kind of KPIs and say for the VC fund that look the other step for, for us would be this kind of we see that we we'll, later on we will pitch for them or VCs are suggesting this kind of roadmap and that's that's one of the criteria how you are choosing VCs that they have some kind of suggestion for you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, normally uh, your current investors will help you get the next investors, right? So they they know, like, if I'm a seed VC, I understand that I come early, and that there's the normal VCs after me, and so as a seed VC, I need to cultivate relationships with the larger VCs, so that when I have an investment that I've made that actually is tracking well. It's like okay, hey, let me call up my my friends upstairs, the bigger bigger funds, uh, uh, you know, because now we've produced good KPIs, they're going to be interested. So so um, yeah, so a good early stage investor is connected to the next stage of investor and will help you uh, op open the door. I think I think the issue is more in reverse, which is uh, studios will go pitch too early. Right. They, 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 they don't want to do the friends and family round because they feel awkward to ask friends and family for money. They don't know any angels because they're just not connected to rich individuals. It's just not in their network. So they don't put the effort to find the angels. And then the seed VCs are visible because they have websites and oftentimes their, their partners attend conferences and stuff like slush and whatever. And so they're jumping ahead two steps to the seed VC and say, Hey, we, we, we're starting a new company. We have a cool idea, but you have no proof. You have no, no prototype, no team, no roadmap, no KPIs, no nothing. And then, and then you're just wasting time with the CVC who wants to see a little more progress. So you really need to go back, start with friends and family, you know, get angel money, you know, participate in an accelerator where you get a bit of funding. I mean, depending where you are in the world, you might also get government grants and other sources of uh, non-dilutive capital. Uh, which is helpful as well. I mean, you know, Finland had that with Tekas and Business Finland. I mean, I don't know what's available uh, in the whole Baltic region, uh, but Canada, we have different sources of R&D funding and, and, and prototype funding and stuff like that that's non-dilutive. Um, but yeah, you really have to be thoughtful about, you know, where you are in the timeline relative to what the expectations are of each category of, of investor. Okay, thanks. And... Uh... Uh, Mohamed is wondering uh, about the valuation template. You provided a lot of sources, you know, uh, to check up. Uh, maybe you have some some kind of uh, valuation template for C CVS AVC stage uh, where the yeah. startups will be able to make that checklist. Yeah, I mean, val valuation is a tricky one. I, I think Joachim has something on his website, like a... Um, uh, I've seen check check Yoke, check uh, elite game developers. They they may have a, a, um, a resource for determining valuation. My advice normally is early stage. 
you should avoid the valuation question and do your fundraising based on convertible notes or safe notes. Uh, and so this is an instrument where you're intentionally not debating value. Uh, they're giving you money now and they will convert. Uh, essentially, they're giving you a loan. So they'll say, oh, you need 100,000. They loan you 100,000. And that loan converts to shares in the future when a priced round, a valued round occurs. So often, friends, family, angel investors, early stage investors will do it on a note because the company is so early that there's no reasonable way to value it. Uh, and so you're sort of deferring the valuation discussion until you've made more progress, you have KPIs, there's value in the company. And then, you know, the, the next round, okay, now we're going to price it. Um, but I, I mean, the, the, the rule of thumb is, is usually... I mean, I, I'm afraid to even say this, but it's usually like 20%. Like you never want to give out more than 20% equity per per round. But that, I mean, that is a very rough, rough, rough rule of thumb um, and sort of really can change depending on the region and your situation and your background and all this kind of stuff. But I mean, if you just sort of put 20 as a kind of super rough ballpark, uh, but um, I, I tend to prefer to avoid that altogether by using convertible notes in the early early stages. Good stuff. So Mohamed also was wondering about the expectations from the VCs. Maybe we can focus on the seed VCs uh, about the exit time, exit time uh, expectation, multiplication, and the how much share they are expecting to get from the company. Yeah, I mean, a, a, angels tend to, uh, you know, understand that they're writing small checks and they'll take, you know, a small, a smaller amount of equity. Uh, again, it's going to depend on whether you're doing this via notes or a price round. Are they putting in ten thousand or a hundred thousand? Um, I mean, normally angels are getting single digit or single percentage points, right? They're they're putting in, uh, you know, whatever a hundred thousand and they're getting five percent or so, something like that. Um, again, it's highly dependent on the nature of the, the deal, but, but angels tend to get, you know, one, you know, a single, uh, you know, single digits, um, time horizon in most cases is very long, uh, you know, execution labs, you, you know, we, I mean, we were an incubator, so kind of angelish in nature. Um, you know, we were often the first investor into the companies you know, we're on a seven, eight, nine year time horizon. Uh, most venture funds are on a, you know, 10 year, seven to 10 year horizon. Of course, angels are individuals. Uh, so they, you know, they can kind of, you know, they, they don't, they don't have a hard, a hard stop. Uh, I think most angels would understand that they're on a five plus year uh, time horizon. Um, in some cases, in some cases, when you have massive growth, uh, and you're doing a, a growth VC round or private equity round, you may buy out the angels at that point, right? You may get situations where, you know, Sequoia is coming in and they're writing you a hundred million dollar check. And, you know, 10 million of that is just to clean out the cap table and sort of pay, pay back the, the angels and kind of just get them, you know, get rid of them. Um, so, so, so you, you sometimes have things like that where the angels kind of get bought out earlier than an actual exit occurs for the company as a whole. Uh, but those are, I would say, are, are exceptions where, you know, things are going really well and you have, uh, you know, big, big VCs coming with huge checks and, and stuff like that. And, 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 and just as a side note, that sometimes is also when the founders might give up some of their shares, right? So if I'm still holding 20% and Sequoia is buying in, they may buy some new stock, but they also may buy, you know, uh, half of the stock of the founders just to kind of put some money in our pockets to reward us. For all the work that we've uh, done so that's but i mean these are all sort of exceptions mm -hmm. and alan is asking about the other type of funding is the funds uh isn't there that some funds are acting like vcs and starting to invest into fairly young companies so sorry the funds that are acting like vcs i'm not sure yeah 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 okay but a vc is a fund uh, uh isn't there some funds that act like VCs that are starting to look fair? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure because I'm confused because a fund is a VC. <laughs> yeah. 
pieces are only relevant for established game companies. Yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, Alan, I don't know if you want to maybe restate the question, but um, yeah, so Alan, uh, if you could just restate and uh, make a comment in the in the chat on Q and A uh, box, and we can uh, move on with the another question, and it was also posted by Mohammed. Uh, how to evaluate the company at an early stage, uh, how much the company usually uh, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, be evaluated and how much it costs. Yeah, well, this is what I would say, uh, you know, don't value the company, right? Like if you do not have revenue streams, if you don't have profits, if you don't have, uh, you know, active users and games and products that are on the market, uh, then it's too hard to really place any meaningful value right? It's just your brains and, and your concepts. Um, and so by using convertible notes, uh, it allows you to avoid pegging the value of the company at such an early stage. Um, so that, that's my recommendation. Otherwise, you're, you're just sort of having a negotiation based on uh, based on air. So. Okay, thanks. And uh, Ola Jurgensen is wondering about the regional advantage. You already touched the topic of uh, regional advantages of in terms of uh, reduced costs for some developers and uh, so forth. Is it still remains a, an advantage when you are pitching, or the company shouldn't e even mention this? And uh, I, I would like to connect this question with the uh, location of the companies when they're, for example, uh, pitching for the uh, VC fund. Is it important where mm. their company is and where the VC fund is located? And how yeah. th did this kind of perception change during the pandemic? Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think I can do a whole lecture just based on location and, and how, how it affects uh, deals or, or otherwise. So uh, some super quick thoughts. Uh, the earlier you are as a company, so you know if you're in the friends and family or angel round, the earlier stages, uh, the closer the investor is to you, right? So if, I, if I'm in, uh, I don't know, whatever, uh, Germany, and I, and I have a, a startup, and I'm doing friends and family, it's likely that my angels are all going to be from Germany. Like angels invest in their backyard. Uh, and then certainly for friends and family, it's like, you know, it's my uncle that lives down the street. It's my doctor friend. That's my neighbor. You know, it's, it's like it's people near you. Um, now, it could be a relationship that's close to you. And my uncle lives in Australia. So geographically he's far away but it's my uncle so so technically he's still close to me so the earlier the funding round uh the closer the investors are wherever you are in the world whether it's australia california germany you know finland whatever so so it's a big mistake when you're early in the company looking for angels or a seed round and you get on a plane and go to silicon valley and say, oh, we heard all the investors are in Silicon Valley. Let's go knock on doors. Doesn't work. There's a couple of reasons. One is uh, uh, legal fees, right? So if you're raising $100,000 seed, you know, pre-seed round, friends and family, 100000 or whatever, two, the legal fees is going to be like half of that, especially if you're dealing with cross-border because now you have to deal with uh, taxation specialists, you have to deal with cross-border law. I mean, we did a deal in Romania and we had to like every document mandatory had to be translated into Romanian and stamped by the government. Like it was a nightmare. It was a total nightmare. And it was an angel, like an angel level deal. We spent half of the money on the legal and taxation you know, specialists. So an angel investor doesn't want to deal with that. Never mind. Uh, if you sell the company and they're in a different jurisdiction and there's tax withholdings and it, it's a nightmare. So angel investors, early stage investors invest in their backyard. They invest close to you. Now, if you're doing, uh, you know, a growth round for a hundred million dollars because your studio has generated 50 million profit, th then, th then the world opens up, right? Then at that point, you call up the Silicon Valley, the Israelis, the, 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 the folks in Berlin and London, you know, Hong Kong, you know, at a hundred million, they can spend dollars on tax specialists and lawyers and it's not, it's not an issue. Uh, 
So, so that timing and stage have an effect. So early stage, stay in your backyard. When you're at the growth stages, okay, you can talk to anybody anywhere. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. So that's one factor. The other one in terms of like cost and whatever, I mean, cost does matter because if I'm investing 1 million and 1 million pays for 20 programmers in, in uh, I don't know, Belarus or something, you know, whereas 20 million or, or 1 million pays for two programmers in San Francisco, you know, that, that makes a difference in terms of the velocity and speed that I can, you know, produce product and, you know, generate uh, code and so on. So that does have an effect. Uh, um, and the other factor is uh, your ability to attract talent. So, you know, if you're in the middle of the desert and, the, and, and, and there's no talent nearby, and if your company starts to scale and the game's taking off, I have to believe that you're going to be able to recruit talent to you know manage the growth. But in the middle of the desert, you know, where, where are you going to get that talent? Now, of course, COVID does change that because like, oh, we'll just get them wherever. It doesn't matter. We all work remote. Uh, but so so prior to the pandemic, there was this sort of sense that, oh, well, if you're in Montreal, you know, there's 15,000 game professionals in that one little city. So if you're if you're the next hot thing, it's going to be easy for you to staff you know, to, to scale your staff. Whereas if you're in, I don't know, I don't know, in Tasmania or something like, you know, there's one guy in a barn making games. So, you know, if you have to staff up, like you have to move or, you know, where, where do you go? So that, that changes a little bit, I think, to, you know, with COVID. Uh, although I still think that the question of if you are succeeding, where are you going to get your staff is a valid question, whether it's remote or down the street or, or whatever. Yeah, okay. so I, I, I can go on and on, but those are my quick. quick very interesting, uh, very in interesting answer. And uh, I want to back to the uh, Alan's questions. He mm -hmm. uh, made a statement that uh, the other part of the question is the more, most important one, and, and it's just the young companies versus the established successful companies. Uh, he's stating that uh, the VCs are only for the established companies. Uh, that have already track record of successful game of making a money and for the young companies uh, VCs are not that relevant uh, correct so so this sort of speaks to the timeline that I was showing uh, I encourage you to go back and look at the the GDC lecture and actually someone put the link in the chat uh, the one at the GDC vault from 2018 so you know the the the, the sort of rule of thumb is, Early stage, young company, no track record, no KPIs, you're the first investor. Friends and family and fools are the second investor. Then it's angels. Then it's seed VCs. Then it's VCs. Then it's growth VCs. And so each category requires the next level of progress, the next level of traction, the next level of KPIs. So if you want to call up a growth VC, you better have a big team, lots of profits, successful products on the market. You're already generating millions of profits and they're going to give you a hundred million dollar check so you can, you know, you can scale and sort of fuel the rocket ship. That's much different than when it's just you and me at the very beginning with a dream and an idea and a few sketches. Well, then it's friends and family. They love us. They put money in early. So, so, so yeah, you don't, you don't go knock on the door of the VC that wants to write hundred million dollar checks, they're going to be like, I, I don't, I don't write a hundred thousand dollars. That's you know, I, I pay my receptionist a hundred thousand dollars. Like don't waste my time. Like, so, so there, there is definitely um, uh, specific investors that are suitable uh, or optimized for the stage that you are at as a company. We touched on that briefly today. I would recommend going back to that GDC lecture, which talks about it in more detail. But Jason, just to clarify what, that on, on the occasion, if uh, I'm achieving all the KPIs through all these steps, you know, mm -hmm. I achieved the angel investors KPIs, then uh, yep. I made those growth uh, uh, KPIs, but it's the first uh, actual project for me and for my co-founders. Uh, co oh. Would the, the next VC, the growth VC, would they invest yeah, in yes. us or they have some worries about uh, no, us? No, so... Um, the KPIs are the truth. 
Okay. So, so if you're a bunch of kids at a school and against all odds, you have the next, you know, clash of clans and, and it's producing, you know, great retention, convert, like, and then the numbers, the KPIs are showing this is a winner. Then, 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 then the investors don't care if you're just a bunch of kids at a school. They'd be like, wow, these kids are geniuses. Let's give them a hundred million to, to fuel this rocket ship that they're already showing us through the numbers and traction and KPIs that it's, you know, it's doing this. So, so yeah, yeah. That's a, a thank you for kind of doing that nuance, but, um, uh, but yeah, the, the, the traction is the truth. And, and, and if you have truth, the investors will, will back you. And Jason, the final question, I promise, but this one is very, very relevant to the European countries because we have a lot of uh, public uh, funding going on here in the, in all, all states. So, mm -hmm. how do you look? How do investors look into programs such as Bis fin Business Finland uh, as a leverage to their investment? Mm -hmm. If uh, the the, the uh, investment could be doubled by the in a financial investment from business Finland, for yeah. example, how does this how does this, this stuff look like for the investor? Yeah, it, it, in most cases, I would say very favorably, right? And if you look at business Finland, uh, I mean, historically it was a, it was a different entity called Tekes, and they had their Skine program. And like between 2012 and 2015, they invested 30 million euros into game studio uh, R and D projects. And in that same time frame, there was about 80 million of foreign venture money that came in to Finland. Much of it was as matching, like they came, they went together. And so a lot of the Finnish studios would secure their tech is money. And then they would go to GDC or go to Gamescom and say, hey, I've already got, you know, half a million committed, you know, from tech is, you know, so, so, hey, I only need, I only need a, another 500 thousand instead of a full million so so they, that that was a good leverage um now obviously the investors are going to care you know what strings are attached is it is it non-dilutive is it a loan is it you know is it debt is it is it a grant that's you know it's a gift from the government um you know what what kind of restrictions on future revenue streams in some cases like in Canada, there's some of these programs, but like you have to recoup the money if you generate revenue. So, so in general, I would say these are seen as very positive because usually when it's coming from the government, it's it's fairly uh, um, relaxed. It's not very aggressive, uh, um, but you know the the investors will want to know what the kind of encumbrance of those gifts are, uh, and if it's truly a gift or is it you know debt or et cetera, et cetera. But as a rule of thumb, they're generally seen as positive. Uh, and and as, a, as a leverage. Now, now, in some cases, it's as a match, right? So Tekes was done in such a way that the Finnish studios would go to kind of match it. Whereas in other regions, other programs, it's more sequential, right? So you use the government money in place of an angel and you use the government money to build your MVP and get your soft launch KPIs. And then you go to the investor as like the next step so it depends on the nature of the program, whether it's sort of a match or whether it's more uh, sequential. Okay, Th thanks, Jason. As I promised, this was the final <laughs> uh, question from us. And uh, nice. just could you let people know where they can find you in case they have a very good project and they want to pitch you or <laughs> ask any questions? You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, I'm, I have a thankfully a fairly unique name, so I, you know, I'm easy to find online. The best thing is just to uh, link to me on on LinkedIn. Just plug my name into the search bar. I'm also on Twitter, but I, I mean, I don't spend so much time there. And then uh, you can just email me uh, Jason at executionlabs.com. But uh, the, the easiest is just to plug my name into LinkedIn and you know chat with me there. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Cool. And awesome. uh, just. Uh, one more remark for the whole, those who are listening listening for us. Uh, please check our uh, also our website balticsteagames.eu because we uh, we will have a lot of stuff going on throughout uh, September, October, November. We'll have uh, tomorrow we'll have mentors workshop. Next there will be investors workshop. I'll also we'll have Autumn Academy. Uh, a workshop on serious games so lots of things going on in uh, baltic sea games so just follow us on uh, 
uh, Facebook, on LinkedIn, and uh, see what's going on. And if you are keen to join us, just write down the message for, for me or for my colleagues, and we will welcome uh, you into our project as well. As well. So thank you, Jason, for being us, with, with us right thank here you so much. early in the morning for, from <laughs> Montreal. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, have a good evening, everyone. And uh, looking forward to seeing you uh, on other webinars. Bye. Bye. All right.